Welcome to Drink, uh, our November edition online, uh, still for obvious reasons. Uh, I'm going to say a few things about stuff that's happened since we last did this, which is only a month ago. Um, not a great deal's happened, got to be honest, not a huge number of slides. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to our first guest speaker, Shahina. Um, and uh, and uh, once Shahina's spoken, we'll hand over to Mr. Barker to do his bit. So there's just the three of us speaking tonight, uh, and I am not going to be speaking for very long, as you will see in a second. Um, so what has been going on with Google Search in past time? Well, if you've ever had the need to use it, uh, and I feel for you if you have, then uh, we have a refreshed disavow tool, um, kind of in Search Console, stroke not in Search Console because there's not actually a link to it in the menu, um, but if you follow the link, you will now get a slightly refreshed version, which looks like this on the slide. What's quite handy about that is you can download the text file of what's, uh, what's happened in the past and it sort of shows you, um, uh, I think if I remember rightly, it shows you more than one as well. So you can see when the, when different uh, submissions of the disavow file were made, which is potentially quite useful. Um, Google say you don't really need it, but if you feel the need for it, here it is. And obviously they must think somebody needs it, otherwise they wouldn't have bothered refreshing it. Uh, so there is that. Should you uh, have any naughty links in your website's profile, that you need to tell Google about. Uh, now, John Mueller was quoted um, in a, a video as saying, uh, well, words that kind of said, no, we know core updates are stressful, so we probably won't do one before the end of the year. And then when he was quoted on that, came out and said, that sounds too optimistic. We haven't actually made a decision yet. So maybe, maybe not. Um, it has been a long time since the last core update, 4th of May. Um, unusually long. So uh, there's certainly one due, but whether it's before or after Christmas remains to be seen, it would seem. Uh, what we do know is that Google's page experience update will be coming in May of next year. So you've still got the best part of six months to uh, sort your site out in that respect. And this is, this is where they're going to be rolling out uh, Core Web Vitals as a signal alongside uh, others which they already use, mobile friendliness, safe browsing, um, serving over HTTPS and intrusive interstitials on mobile. Um, so all of those things being rolled into what they call page experience and uh, they're going to display a visual indicator. So those of you with reasonable memories will uh, remember the um, little symbols uh, or notifications of some sort uh, that we have in um, uh, in the past for mobile friendliness, for example. Um, and uh, this is going to be something similar by the looks of it. They said they're going to test it. So no doubt some people will see that. We'll know what it's going to look like before next May. Um, uh, but the actual effect on the search results in terms of rankings is going to come in May. And, and if you read the documentation, it's, it's like what they say about site speed and stuff in the past, uh, which is uh, essentially it's not the biggest ranking factor. Good content trumps it. But if you've got lots of similar pages in terms of content quality, then it becomes a bigger factor in, in sorting them out. Um, also, along with this change, uh, we're going to see that uh, AMP pages um, won't be required any longer if you want to feature in top stories carousel. Um, probably doesn't affect too many of us that, but uh, if you're dealing with publishers and, and regular bloggers, then uh, you don't need AMP to get into that top stories carousel anymore from next May, which would probably be a blessed relief. Uh, on the PPC side of things, one horrific sounding uh, application of uh, a Google setting. You might remember last year, Google talked about um, auto enrolling um, Google Ads accounts in um, this kind of automated recommendations uh, getting applied um, if you didn't opt out. And um, not a lot more was heard of it, but then some chap uh, earlier in the week uh, logged into an account and found out changes had been made and there was nothing in the change history. So no users had logged in and done anything to this account, but it had done things like, I think it was um, something like tax, uh, tax preparation or something like that is an American thing. And uh, all his keywords were around tax preparation. They basically all contain that kind of terminology. And Google had automatically added taxes.com as a keyword to his account in broad match, and he was spending 50% more than he thought he was. Um, and it turned out because whoever owned the, that his client or whatever had um, uh, allowed this thing to opt in. 
um, to the uh, auto applied recommendations. So there is a control center for that if you've never seen it, and I certainly hadn't until now. Um, and the link is on there. The story about it is on search engine land there. If you manage Google ads for anybody, it's worth just scanning down the list when you click through on this page here to make sure nobody is um, opted into this thing because it's clearly going to screw with your account. Um, Google also announced uh, a couple of days ago some smart bidding improvements. Um, they've got simulators for some of the smart bidding options, target CPA, RAS budget. Um, so these are search for search campaigns at the moment. And they'll predict up to 90 days into the future and it's supposed to incorporate seasonality and things like that, um, which is uh, no doubt welcome if you're trying to work out how changes might affect campaign performance. And um, also there's more visibility of the factors that smart bidding is using and what it's optimizing towards in terms of target figures, um, which is, is potentially rather useful because it is rather opaque. Um, and you can get conversion estimates by hovering over the conversions data in the campaigns tab which looks like this. So there you've got the conversions uh, column on your campaigns tab there and you hover over that. This is the box that appears um, and tells you um, basically how much more you could spend and, and fill Google's coffers by uh, in order to achieve certain figures. But it is quite, uh, quite interesting. So it also tells you um, something like this here, which is interesting. It takes up to five days after an impression for most customers to convert. So a bit of insight into performance as well as how things could be different if you change the settings or essentially spent more with Google. Uh, there is now an official Google Ads connector or add-on for Google Sheets as well. Um, this is uh, basically to, to pull data straight in from Google Ads. Um, you may well be doing that with something like Supermetrics already or, or some other solution, but uh, you can get the official Google one now. I haven't had a chance to play with it, but I read a couple of comments saying that it it's fine and it works, but it, it's limited in the fields that you can uh, you can pull in there. So uh, depending what you need to do with it, you might still need a third party solution. But um, want to have a play with if you do use that kind of stuff as it is free after all. OK, that is all I really have to update you on uh, because it has only been a month since we spoke. And not a great deal has happened, as you can see, of any particular note. Um, we don't yet have another date for uh, the next drink. So keep your eyes peeled. Not sure if we're going to do one for Christmas or not. It almost feels a bit kind of flat to do that, given that we can't all get together. Um, but we'll see. We'll see if we get something together or not. Um, so I am going to hand over to uh, Shahina to do her bit. And I suspect that needs me to uh, stop sharing my screen. So I'm going to stop sharing that. And hopefully, Shahina, you can push the share screen button. And okay. it will here. Is the magic going to happen? Let's see. Is the magic going to happen? OK, let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, there we go. Cool, great. OK, um, well, uh, going to be a little bit longer than Ian, I think. Um, hopefully, it won't take up too much of your time. But uh, if you do have any questions, of course, feel free to, to unmute yourselves and ask away. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about how we can convert our hard earned traffic with conversion rate optimization. And I know we're all sitting through, I guess, lockdown part two, counting down the days to till when it's over. I don't know about you guys. Um, but I think it's so important throughout lockdown and, and throughout this pandemic where we've seen this big shift towards becoming more and more relevant online. And lots of money has been going into digital marketing, um, but it's just as important to actually take that traffic that we're already paying for and make sure that we convert it, right? So acquisition is important, but also obviously converting that traffic is really important. And when we're talking about you know, paid media, like Ian was talking about, so looking at a lot of different KPIs, one of them that we talk about all the time is cost per acquisition. And we all know that this is spend over conversions. And what I wanna to concentrate today on is that last bit, right? How do we make sure that we up this number so that the CPA can come down? And the way in which we do that is through conversion rate optimization. So uh, you may have seen so many different frameworks for CRO, um, but at the end of the day, whatever that framework looks like, the premise is always the same. Um, 
And so we always start with data and research. So trying to understand the user behavior, points of friction, um, areas of opportunity to then be able to move into evidence-based design. So really trying to take the evidence that we have from data and design a better experience or to alleviate friction, to make something better on the site, to optimize it, right? And then at its basic core, then obviously going to testing. So A versus B, half your traffic sees the control, half your traffic sees your new design to be able to then statistically measure did that do well? So then you move into that results analysis. And, and with the results, it's really about looking at, did it do well? And if it did, great. And if it didn't, what did we learn from it? And how do we then move into this cyclical process of going through data, design, test re results over and over again to make it better and better and better? Um, and a lot of our clients come to us, uh, you know, when they start CRO, and they start with data and research, but then they're like, oh, you know, I really want to change this because I think it's it's what I think would work. And I, I really love using this slide to say, you know what, you are not the user. And that's something that we always have to keep in mind, right? We are not the user. We have to start with that data and research to be able to understand who our users are, to be able to then empathize with them, right? So understand why are they there? What are their goals? What are they trying to achieve? Because users aren't on our sites for no reason, right? They are there for a particular reason. And by understanding user empathy and by understanding what they're there for, we can then move towards making more relevant experiences for them. So relevance can be uh, you know, cut up into many different ways. And today I'm gonna cut relevance out into three different ways. Um, making sure that we get the right message to the right person at the right time. And I'm going to give you three different examples, one from uh, the right message, the right person, and the right time. And the first one is really looking at landing page optimization. So how do we make sure that the user gets the right message? So we're going to look at um, symmetrical messaging. And symmetrical messaging uh, really is just making sure that we have alignment between paid media and the landing page, where as I'm sure you all know, we've seen so many cases where this just doesn't exist. So one of the examples that I have is with one of our clients called Housekeep. Um, and they're a house cleaning service in the UK. And what we were seeing was that users were coming in and they were you know, searching on Google cleaning services in London or cleaning services in Leeds. Um, and then they would be served this localized ad, you know, house cleaning services in London, house cleaning services in Leeds, right? And they would then land on this landing page. And when we went through our CRO cyclical design phase, we, or the data phase, sorry, what we saw was that, you know, we were acquiring a lot of traffic, really high click through rates on this type of campaign. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but what we saw was that balance rate was really high and conversion was really low compared to all of their other campaigns. So there was a big problem here. And so when we went in and stepped into the user's shoes to be able to empathize with the user, you start to understand that, you know, users are looking for something in their area. You don't want a housekeeper to come in from Manchester to, you know, come into London to clean your house. It just doesn't make sense. You want to know that they're in your area to come and clean your house. So um, we went into evidence-based design. We started to uh, pick up different designs, what we can do and make it more relevant. And one of the things that we tested against this particular landing page is actually dynamically changing that landing page to match the city that they're coming from. So a really small change, you know, nothing dr dramatic or drastic, but just matching London to London there, Leeds to Leeds there, and any other city that was part of this campaign making sure that they saw this relevant city for them. And just making that small change, what we saw in our results was a 9% increase in conversion rates. So just making that small change to be a little bit more relevant, that test proved to be a lot more efficient. So that's getting the right message. Then we move into getting it to the right person. So really trying to understand our audiences and then trying to optimize for those audiences. Um, so we all know that our audience doesn't look like this, right? Our, I wish it was that simple, you know, audiences are never this um, similar. You know, our audiences have so many different cross sections of uh, segments, you know, these people want product X, um, there's previous purchasers, high lifetime value, and it can go on and on and on, returning new, etc. And so 
giving these users one generic experience makes no sense because each part of this audience is looking for something different or has a different goal or has a different uh, motivation behind why they're at the site. So understanding that and providing the right experience can do wonders. So I'll give you another example. Um, one of our clients, Sigma Sport, they are a bike and triathlon retailer. Um, so they sell bikes, they sell clothing, nutritional uh, accessories, and this is across a hundred different brands. And what we saw with the data was that um, about half the returning users were coming to the homepage. And you can see here, the homepage has, I don't know, like nine or 10 different products or uh, promotions shouting at the user. And it's basically like a roulette, like hopefully something will capture the user's attention and it will work. Um, but that's, that's just, it wasn't working because we noticed that only about 2% of users were clicking on any of these promotions. So when we looked into the data, what we saw was that people weren't bucketed into uh, these product categories. People weren't only coming in for clothing and only coming in for accessories. In fact, users had an affinity to a specific brand. So if a user, for example, came in and purchased this uh, specialized bike, they would then come back and purchase the specialized um, helmet, the gloves, the jacket, the everything that goes, the entire kit that goes within that particular um, brand. So users had a brand affinity. And so what we did was we bucketed all of these users into their brand affinity audiences. And instead of showing them nine different products on the homepage, we actually just showed them um, what their particular brand was. So we started showing them these audience, for example, would see a specialized um, creative on the landing page, same with the Castelli. So they would then see something that was related to their favorite brand. And again, what we saw was a really big increase in just making it a little bit more relevant to what the user was looking for. So again, testing this really uh, was able to show us that increase in conversion rates. And the last example that I want to go through is getting the right message to the right person at the right time. So really looking at the customer journey um, and becoming more relevant at the per particular time that they are in. So. We've all seen you know, funnels like this or other ways. And we know that the user goes up and down, round and round through these funnels. But at the end of the day, we know that users actually do have particular places in that um, purchasing journey where they need different types of information. So what we did for one of our clients was we took that awareness, consideration and action phase. And we said, okay, well, what can we do for those users who are in the awareness phase? What kind of information do they need and how can we make sure that it's relevant for them? So we started to think about discovery content, right? Like what can we do? So for example, we started to promote um, popular categories. So the user can then see, uh, oh yeah, this is uh, you know what the brand is about. This is what they offer. And when they moved from awareness into consideration, we then were trying to think about kind of informational content can we provide these users, right? So. An example would be adding social proof, adding testimonials, adding value propositions. What is it, what information does that user need to be able to move from just considering the product to actually adding it to the basket and potentially actually um, purchasing? And then finally, if that user then moves into um, action and added something to their basket, then it was time for us to think about conversion content. So. Uh, what we also tried was adding basket reminders. So users would come back and then we would say, pick up where you left off, check out now, right? So helping the user get to that action that they wanted to get to if they so wanted. And so doing this across the entire funnel and putting the right messaging at the right point in time of their journey, we again saw increases throughout testing this particular, um, for this particular client. So, you know, I've been talking about three different examples where we went through the data, we went through the design, we went through the testing and then results. And it seems like, oh, wow, that's a lot of work, right? But how much does could this actually be worth? Is it really worth doing CRO? And I'll take a really quick example of, let's say you have a marketing spend of 20K. And let's say that brings in hypothetically 50,000 visits to the site. Okay, so. Let's think about if BAU, we have a 2% conversion rate with a few simple math, right? 2% of 50K is 1,000 conversions. 
1,000 conversions. If each conversion is worth 100 pounds, we're looking at 100,000 in revenue, and which calculates to 20 pounds cost per acquisition and five pounds return on ad spend, right? So that's normal, business as usual, that's what's happening. Now, what if we spend a little bit of time, a little bit of money on um, doing conversion rate optimization? And what if we move that 2% up to 3%? What, the, what happens then? So again, using the same numbers that we had in the beginning, what we see is of course, increase in conversions, increase in revenue, decrease in cost per acquisition, and increase in return on ad spend. So just taking that little bit of time to do conversion rate optimization, become more relevant to the user, um, it then that testing will be able to show you these types of KPIs, these types of numbers, so that we can become more relevant to convert um, hard-earned traffic. I, I whizzed through that, but does um, anybody have any questions? Nobody's speaking, Sheena, so. Bob, you made not. it super clear. I'm going to take that as a good sign. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So uh, that was a, a whistle-stop tour through whistle some stop. CRO there. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, it's uh, very true. You know, serving the same experience to everybody, despite the fact that we've got so much data about them, is not really a very clever thing to do. And uh, good insight and examples there as well. Thank you very much for that. Much appreciated. Um, Thank you. So uh, if, if nobody has any questions for Shaheen, or if you do pop them into the um, into the chat box, he says clicking on the chat box, there we go, nothing in there. Okay, that's fine. But if you've got any questions, um, pop them in the chat box and we, we can go back to Shaheen at the end of, uh, at the, end of the session and, and get her to answer those. So please feel free to pop them in there. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to hand over to my esteemed colleague, Mr. Barker, um, who I'm assuming can also hit the share screen button and make exciting things appear. Come on, Wayne, you can do it. There we go. Lovely. Okay. Over to you, Mike. Do you see that? All good? Yeah, all good. All good. Marvellous. Right. A uh, couple of things before we uh, before we get started. Number one, uh, a, a massive thank you to uh, Mr. Peter Bingham for making this presentation uh, look awesome. He's been drawing pictures for the last couple of days for me. Uh, number two, apologies that uh, most of you are only going to be able to see up my nose at this point. I have a stupid uh, uh, laptop that has the camera in one of the keys down the middle. So I've managed to uh, uh, lift it up a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> luckily, we trimmed my hair just before uh, I came on, so that's all good. Right, <clears throat> let's get cracking. So I've uh, I've got myself a San Miguel here, uh, and what we're talking about today uh, is is uh, fear and loathing in Las Malaga, uh, uh, with the subtitle of "Move on, be brave, and take the bullshit by the horns." Uh, so let's get cracking. Um, so those of you who've been to drink before uh, will know that I used to speak quite often. Um, uh, but I've taken a little bit of a break. Uh, there's three reasons for that. One is uh, we start doing these every month and it was incredibly difficult for me to keep coming up with new ideas. Uh, uh, the second one is I prefer to be in a room. So uh, we've often used props and uh, uh, audience interaction and stuff like that. Uh, so I did take a little bit of a break. The third one is gonna become more obvious as we go through the slides. Um, so now we're online, a lot of you might not know who I am. So here we go, a little bit about me. Nah, no one actually wants to know about me. You're here to learn stuff. Uh, the one thing you do need to know about me is the esteemed uh, um, broadcaster and best-selling author, uh, uh, James O'Brien, uh, once saw one of my presentations and called me very sweary. So, um, that's uh, uh, something to take away. There is going to be some language uh, at some point, especially if I get too excited about what I'm talking about. So here we go. I have a formula for these kind of presentations, and it looks a little bit like this. I add in some pop culture references. I add in something a little bit oblique, uh, and then I introduce SEO, and that's how I get my presentation. Uh, everyone claps, and then I go home still uh, unhappy with what I've produced and think that uh, I'm useless, but there we go. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about myself uh, um, uh, uh, in a little bit, 
So, um, but before we get to that, I'm going to state something that is so fucking obvious, it's unbelievable. 2020, it's been a bit of a dick, right? And I like to break rules when I do a presentation, so I'm going to say absolutely nothing for the next few slides. I'm just going to play you some slides uh, uh, and you can take it all in. There you go, 2020, been an absolute dick. Now, people who, who come to uh, drink regular know that I tend to try and make funny presentations uh, and that somehow I managed to get them into uh, uh, something about digital marketing, whether it's SEO or content marketing or whatever that is. Uh, so I want you to hold your horses at the moment because I have not finished being depressing yet. So we know that 2020 is shit. Uh, I, I want to tell you a little story. Um, my 2020 has probably been a little bit worse than yours. Uh, uh, I, I'm sorry about that. I don't want sympathy. Uh, I'm, I'm not looking for sympathy on this, uh, but I think there's a reason behind why what I'm going to tell you, uh, uh, what I'm going to tell you in the next 20 or 30 slides, I think, hopefully. So this is what happened to me during lockdown. So the date was uh, April 21st, the time was 4 p.m. I was getting close to finishing for the day. I'd been at it most of the day and I was uh, just in the kitchen uh, uh, making a little drink and fetching one for my girlfriend, Amy. Uh, we now have a, a little slide uh, uh, that tells Amy she can look away from the screen at the moment because she's not seen the pictures that I'm about to share with everyone now. That's my apartment or just to the left of my apartment. Uh, as that started, I was just below there. Uh, that's my apartment uh, as the fire raised through uh, uh, up above uh, and uh, uh, sort of went and completely across uh, our uh, apartment and the apartments to the other side. And this is what our bedrooms look like. Now, if this had happened at 4 a.m. in the morning rather than 4 p.m. in the afternoon, I think you can guess that uh, we might not be here today. So you can look back now, Amy. <clears throat> so this was my lockdown. After that, after 4 p.m. that day, we spent two months in a hotel. Then we spent two days, uh, two more days in a hotel, then three months in temporary accommodation, two more days in a ho hotel, and then we did this. There are the four suitcases that had everything in it that we owned. So basically the fire pretty much took everything that we had. And this is where the title comes in. We took the bullshit by our horns. And what we did was we packed all of our shit up, all the shit that we had left anyway, and we moved over to Malaga. <clears throat> so when we got to Malaga, we spent a couple of days in another hotel, and then we moved into an Airbnb for a month. And now, until next July, uh, we have a home again. So I guess you're wondering why I'm telling you this. There is a reason. I know that things change in digital marketing all the time. SEO in particular is, 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 the, is the, uh, an industry that moves so fast, it can be really tough to keep up with it sometimes. Um, and you need not to be fearful of that. Uh, and this is another uh, Hunter S. Thompson quote, never turn your back on fear. It should always be in front of you like a thing that might have to be killed. So how does this relate to SEO? So what I'm going to do now is bring this story into uh, uh, um, some SEO uh, tips, some tools, uh, and how we can move on and change things. Anyone that's worked in SEO for any amount of time knows that updates happen. Uh, Ian talked briefly about uh, core updates earlier. Uh, this particular slide only shows uh, some of the updates from 2011 through to about 2015. Uh, the last five years, that's in increased exponentially so shit changes shit changes a lot and i don't want you to rely on on the old checklist 
that we used to go by. So if you go back a few years, you would look at SEO, you'd have a checklist of things that you needed to work on uh, and you would try and get through those. I'm not saying that I don't want you to do the basics, you know, title tags are still important, meta descriptions are still important, alt tags are still important, these things are still important. But the thing with best practice is that when everyone's doing it, when everyone's doing it, it doesn't make that much difference. You're not differentiating yourself from the other people. And SEO has become more, more so popular now that, you know, any site in the top 10 for most given queries has had some kind of SEO done on it in the past. Google is always going to throw us these curveballs. They're uh, uh, constantly trying to improve their search results. It's the only way that they can keep growing as a business and keep providing the sort of answers that we expect now. So by taking the bullshit by the horns, what I'm asking people to do or what I want you to think about is how you step out of your comfort zone, how you are brave and do things that are different to what other people are doing. So um, spotting changes is, is one of the first things uh, you can do. And there's plenty of tools for this. Sam Rush have one, Rank Ranger have one, uh, uh, Advanced Web Ranking have one. Uh, in this particular slide, I'm uh, uh, going to show you the Systrix one, and I'm not showing Systrix just because they're a sponsor of Drink, but I'm showing Systrix just because they're a sponsor of Drink, and I do actually use them quite a lot. In fact, uh, uh, most of the team at Boom uh, are in and out of Systrix every day. So they've got this, uh, uh, you can see losers and winners on a, on a weekly basis of which sites have done uh, uh, better in that given week and which ones have done worse. And what you can do is you can graph that over a, a, a particular time, time frame for a particular site. And what you get here is if you look at all those little uh, um, um, uh, markers, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and, and so on, uh, they all uh, relate to a specific update uh, in Google. So you're able to see whether a recent update has uh, helped or hindered your particular site. I don't want you to go back to these trusted checklists to try and solve those problems because those checklists don't solve the, the issues that we have when we see, in particular, recently core updates that uh, had a, uh, a big shift in uh, 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 the search results. It's about going back to the tool that's most important, the two tools that are most important, your eyes and your brain. If you want to do SEO, yeah, having tools is handy, but your eyes and gathering data uh, and using your brain to try and interpret that is the way that you need to move forward. Not use out-of-date checklists that appear on uh, uh, um, sites like Backlinko or Moz or whatever. Um, you know, you need to be coming up with your own checklist. Um, and I've talked about it before uh, in a, a, a presentation that I did a couple of years ago that was called Be More Pumped for the Experts. I don't want you to take what they say uh, as gospel because a lot of the experts don't even do SEO anymore. Yes, they might be looking at the service, but they're not actually uh, practicing SEOs anymore. They tend to be working on the uh, speaking circuit or writing books uh, and that kind of thing. And scraping search results to try and figure out exactly what's happening is, is, is a great way to uh, um, figure out where you're gonna take your site or how you're gonna fix particular things. Now, I appreciate that not everyone uh, uh, has the time to learn how to use scraping tools properly. Uh, and that's where, you know, uh, other tools come in. So this is a, a pretty new tool called uh, Through. And what it does is you pop in a keyword and it scrapes the search results for you. So you can see on the left there that it's come back with some stirp stats about the number of results, uh, the word count of those particular uh, uh, um, uh pages that rank uh, and even stuff like when the content was last updated and stuff like that and then you can dig down even further and it tells you which page is the longest or where the questions come in or uh, um, that kind of data and it brings in the standard sort of stuff like headings uh, your, your table your h2s your h3s your h4s whether there's links on the page how many are outbound how many images uh, it's finding and what this is doing is it's allowing you to gather the data of the real-time search results to see this site ranks for this particular keyword what are the properties of this site and how does it help it rank 
uh, and it goes through stuff like meta descriptions. You can find keyword frequencies uh, within there, which helps with uh, um, sort of coming up with new concepts about what to write on your pages. Uh, and a recent uh, update that Samuel did to it, that uh, uh, the guy who made it, uh, is he had added in performance reports as well. So if you've got data from the uh, Chrome UX report and, and, and stuff like that as well. So you can see, you know, do I need to bench myself benchmark myself against a particular site how fast are the sites in this set of search results because one of the things is it doesn't matter which search results you're in it's always going to be different now there's no i don't want to use the word quick wins but there's no sort of uh predefined checklist that you can follow you need to be looking at those particular uh, uh, search results and seeing what works for them what is working for this particular keyword um, and this is the thing now it's FEO isn't just words and HTML and stuff now it's, it's pretty much everything it's pretty much everything so I don't want people to be scared about stepping away from old checklists or, or stepping away from processes that they've had in their business uh, um, for years um, and, and the thing is you know, not all of us are the gaffers, so it becomes a bit weird if they're telling you to follow a particular checklist or a, a particular process. Um, then you know, you're going to be worried about pissing your your superior off. Uh, and what I'd say to that is, this is something that we had on the uh, uh, wall at Boom in our old office for for many, many, many years. And this is just about asking for forgiveness and not permission. You want to be able to go off and do things and try new things. And yes, we fail. Sometimes we fuck it up. But in reality, what we need to do is find these new ways of doing things and then applying them as a business uh, to how we operate as, as SEOs in the future. Uh, something else that I think is particularly important when uh, when we're looking at the search results and, and what ranks is, you know, we don't just want to look at the backlinks. We don't just want to look at the title tags. Uh, we want to actually see what these sites look like. We know that Google is interested in, in uh, ranking sites that, that not only are optimized well, but work well and serve the needs of the user. So actually sitting there and going through every uh, set of 10, 20 results for every keyword that you want to rank for is, is, is not something that's particularly easy to do. So what, what you need to do is you need to come up with a way to actually make that happen uh, and get some, some, some other way, get a tool to do the actual grunt work. So this is a tool we've featured at Drink uh, many times over, over the years. This is URL Profiler, which was originally uh, built by the guys at Sitebulb, which, uh, and Sitebulb are a sponsor, so I'll just say Sitebulb's amazing. But URL Profiler, um, um, what it lets you do is take screenshots of any website or web page. Now, the way most people would use this is they put in their domain and they get a, uh, uh, a set of images uh, for their site so that if when they do a migration or they get a new site and they fuck it up, they can always see what it used to look like. But there's another way of using this. So if you go and look at your uh, uh, keyword, obviously, as this is uh, incredibly well themed by myself and Pete, we're looking for Hunter S. Thompson there. And that little tool on the right is called uh, SEO Minion. And what that will do is it will let us download the uh, search results uh, into a CSV and it will just give us all the URLs. We've not got to go and grab them by hand. You can then drop that into URL profiler in the URL list on the right hand side there and then press a little button that says screen capture. So essentially what you've done is you've just put the SERPs into URL profiler and then you're telling it to go and grab the screen capture of every single one of those pages. And you can see from this image here that, you know, you can grab desktop, tablet, uh, mobile, portrait, landscape, all those kind of things. And uh, um, Patrick, who, who, who was uh, part of the team that built this, uh, even put little uh, cool things in like file saving where you can send, save separate folders for each domain, separate folders for each URL. Uh, not only is that save you loads of time, but you can also take it to your gaffer or your clients and they think you've done shit loads of work when in reality you've been sat around uh, letting a tool do it for you while you've been drinking beer and eating crisps. And what you've got now on a, in a folder on your computer or Google Drive, whatever you use, you've got a bank of images 
uh, of sites that do rank for a particular keyword and you can look at them and decide and think about what makes them uh, what, or what makes Google interested in ranking uh, those sites and how they look and how they work over other sites. Um, and we've moved away from the checklist again. And the thing is, we can take this a little bit deeper as well. And we can look at absolutely everything. Oh, I say absolutely everything, but a lot of things that are related to the search results. And we're going now with benchmarking. This is all about benchmarking and not using old fashioned checklists. So this is a tool we use at Boom. Um, one that we've used uh, for some time now. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's, uh, it's not particularly expensive. They don't do a free version as far as I know. Um, but what it does is it, it analyzes the set of search results for a particular keyword. You can see again, uh, because of our uh, uh, ability to theme these things so uh, well, we've uh, looked for Hunter S. Thompson again. We drop that into the uh, uh, tool and we get back stuff like this. So what this is doing is it's uh, showing uh, um, how many words are on a particular page in the top 50 of Google, uh, how many important common words and phrases are missing. And we can average that out or we can take it down uh, to see just the top 10. Now, the thing is with uh, Surfer SEO is it's not just counting keywords. We want to look deeper than that. Uh, Surfer SEO has something like about 200 different metrics that you can graph. So what you're doing is you're going, right, okay, these are the things that rank top 10. They're not necessarily ranking just because of the title tag. They might be ranking because of other things. So we can dig in, we can look and see how many uh, in this, uh, this slide, how many, uh, uh, how the hidden content on the page affects the ranking. You know, some kind of search results probably need more information on them, but uh, you, you, a lot of the sites might be hiding that content just to make it easier for mobile. So you can take that data away and make more uh, real world informed decisions. Uh, you can look at the structured data. Uh, and if you look at that slide on the left hand side there, you can see the kind of structured data types that are being used uh, by the sites that rank for Hunter S. Thompson. You can take this data away and go and have a look at it and make more, more informed decisions. <clears throat> and uh, um, if you can't afford uh, uh, something like Surfer SEO, there are free tools out there that uh, help you compare and benchmark different sites. So this is uh, PageSpeak Compare. Uh, and all you do is you drop in the URLs of your competitors uh, and it gives you the uh, uh, Lighthouse performance metrics. It, it tells you uh, how useful the content or is the content, the time to first buy, the first content for, uh, content for paint, uh, speed index and all those kind of things. There's so much data in there. Uh, and you can see uh, as well, it gives you these render timelines as well. So you can take the top 10 and you can see, right, okay, is the one, is a site that's in position one, uh, uh, loading faster and giving the content to the, uh, to the user quicker. Uh, and you can work out if in this particular niche, whether you need to improve your page speed. One of the things you see with lots of SEO agencies is they'll just go, yes, you need to improve your page speed uh, because Google says they like fast sites. In reality, you might be up, up against a bunch of sites that have really shitty uh, page uh, paid load speech. So you don't then need to be concentrating on that. You need to be concentrating on the things that do appear to be helping those pages rank. And it's different niche by niche, topic by topic, keyword by keyword. Um, and yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff in in, in uh, that tool that helps you figure that out. We can see how quick uh, um, uh, Wikipedia loads and uh, and the fact that they hardly use JavaScript, which is uh, very uncommon these days. So you're going to figure out who owns the SERPs as well. So this is a pretty new tool called um, SERP Sketch. Uh, and what I did here uh, is take the Hunter S. Thompson uh, uh, example and pretended that I owns uh, the Wikipedia page. And what it does, this is not a mock-up. This is what it comes back with. It tells you uh, your site and how much of the uh, SERPs you own for that particular keyword. And you can pop in your competitors as well. And it tells, tells you how much uh, they own of it. And you get these little images back. So we can see that if I owned Wikipedia and particularly the Hunter S. Thompson's page, 
uh, that up in the organic, uh, I've got lots of, uh, uh, well, I've got all of the space there. And you see to the right on that set, uh, set of search results, there's a knowledge graph. So I own all of that as well. But when you go into the questions and the other organic stuff, competitors do better there. So now I can go away and go, right, you know what? I own this uh, particular Wikipedia page for Hunter S. Thompson. Uh, and I can see that, you know, I don't own much of the question section there. So you can go and optimize your page to bring in those questions to answer those questions. Uh, and this is just a great visual way of, of uh, being able to gather that data and make more informed decisions. Uh, you can have it as that lovely little uh, image, or you can then, or you, or you can have it as a URL view as well. I prefer the little image to be fair, um, but this gives you a bit more information about what the questions are uh, and which ones you might want to rank for. And this is essentially what I, I wanted to come down to, or what I'm trying to get across, the benchmarking is your new checklist. Benchmarking is your new SEO checklist. And benchmarking for each site that you work on, or benchmarking for each set of topics or keywords uh, uh, that you want to rank for. Obviously, you're not going to be able to do this for every single keyword, but the most important ones, you get in there and uh, you, you actually start to benchmark. And the thing is, it takes it takes guts to step away from how you've always done things. Um, and uh, it's it's really important that you just move forward without having uh, without having too much fear. Um, don't get stuck in a rut. Don't get used to using the same checklist over and over again, because in reality, it doesn't matter how bad shit is. There's always something that can be done. And uh, even the worst can look beautiful. So here's an image of my uh, burning flats that actually looks incredibly, incredibly beautiful. And I love this picture as much as it's had an impact on my life. I can take this away. And you know what? I live in Malaga now. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I've got a, a very happy, stable life. And that wouldn't have happened as quick as it did if we hadn't gone through this. Uh, so there's always light at the end of the tunnel. And the thing is, it's not always perfect. Not always perfect by any stretch of the imagination. We know from 2020, it's not always fucking perfect. So this is my daughter, Bethany, uh, who, because of the uh, uh, rules at the moment. I can't get back to the UK and see her. Uh, I do believe she's watching. Uh, Beth, uh, if you are, I love you and I'll see you soon. Um, and it's, not, it's this thing that it's not always perfect, but you know, you, you just move on and you make things happen. Here are the Zoom calls that you know you guys are all familiar with. This is with my family. And I'm gonna be honest, I miss every single one on there apart from my mum who's down at the bottom. Uh, love you, mum. Um, and the things you've got to do is you've got to make these decisions for the long term. You've got to be brave. Uh, one of the things I've always said to our SEO guys is you've got to skate where the fucking puck is going. Uh, I can't remember who said it. It was some hockey player, some American hockey. Wayne Gretzky said it. You need to be figuring out what's going to happen in the future. So Ian mentioned called Web Vitals. Um, and you need to be looking at that now because next year that's going to be some kind of ranking factor. You need to be getting ahead. Uh, the passage indexing that's uh, been announced recently. Get ahead of the competition, make changes, be brave. And this is how you're going to win long term because these things work out. You know, there's a cheesy picture of my flat with a rainbow on it, which I just think is fucking beautiful. We can win. You've just got to be brave. You don't follow. You just do not follow the fucking sheep. Be brave. Don't follow the herd. That's pretty much it from me tonight and I've stayed at the 25 minutes uh, so thank you very much uh, for those that haven't uh, seen me speak before I apologize for my language uh, but uh, uh, unfortunately that's how it is uh, and I'll see you all soon lovely thank you Mr Barker if anybody has any questions now is the time to pipe up literally or type it into the chat box whichever your preference is uh, either for Wayne or for Shaheen, who's still with us here as well. Um, so if anybody's got anything they want to ask, comment on, or otherwise raise, now is the time. I'm just going to give a moment for you to all type. I'm sure you're all incredibly fast typers and you would be banging those questions out if you had them. But uh... I'm looking forward to a question from uh, Peter Jones. 
the Peter Dragon, Jones. Dragon's Dun Man. Yeah, well, me too. Peter Jones, who we once saw get out of his Maybach and go into yeah. the restaurant below our uh, old office, as I recall. Yep. Quite tall, isn't he, Peter Jones? That's, he is quite tall. That's what I took from that. Uh, excellent. Okay, well, I'm not sure we've got any questions coming through. Um, it's it's now really just over to Mr. Peter Bingham for his partial nudity. I think that's as you've clearly promised that in the group chat there, Pete. So uh, no, um, no, sorry, just it was on, no. Oh, you it turned the camera on. off. Oh, what a surprise! There we go. <laughs> Never mind. It was, okay, I'm going to uh, I'm going to wrap this up then. If we've got no other questions coming through, thanks everybody for your time uh, and attendance this evening. Much appreciated. Hope you take something from it. The presentations will be uploaded online uh, and, and John will send you an email out from Meetup with the link to that. Um, we'll also let you know the next time we have a drink planned, whenever that may be, maybe this year, maybe not, maybe not until 2021. So if we don't get anything until then, happy Christmas. Have a fantastic new year. Let's all hope it can't be any worse than this one. Uh, OK. Good night, everybody. Bye, all. Thanks for coming.